Welcome to The Cause Conversations. I am your host, Raylan Rabaka, founder and director of the Center for African and African American Studies, which we call The Cause, here at the University of Colorado Boulder. Today we are joined by Professor Suzette Malveaux. Uh, Suzette Malveaux is Moses Lasky Professor of Law and Director of the Byron R. White Center for the Study of American Constitutional Law. Welcome to the show. Great, thank you. It's a privilege to be here. Oh, we are very honored to have you as our very, very, very first guest. Uh, wow, incredible, incredible <laughs> experience. Great. Great. So, I'd like to I'd, I'd like to start. Could you tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, your professional background, and your area of expertise? Sure. Um, I am well. I've been here at University of Colorado just a little over three years, so I'm relatively sort of new to the community. Um, I'm sort of a transplant from the East Coast. Um, I have, although I'm new to uh, CU, I'm not new to teaching. I've been teaching almost 20 years. Uh, yeah. So <laughs> you can believe that. Uh, so I've been. I teach in uh, in a variety of areas, but primarily uh, my focus has been civil rights, civil procedure, employment discrimination. I teach a constitutional law seminar. I used to teach complex litigation. So that's kind of the, um, you know, the, the range of topics that I teach. And before, um, before being a teacher and a scholar, I was a civil rights lawyer and uh, for about eight years in Washington DC with a real focus on uh, employment discrimination in particular and uh, class action, sort of complex litigation and aggregate litigation. So, um, and much of my writing goes to the intersection mm -hmm. of civil procedure on the one hand and civil rights on the other, and sort of ask the question, how does civil procedure or procedural mechanisms impact our ability to enforce uh, civil rights, right? These very precious laws that so many people have died for and fought so hard for, uh, what is the connection between the procedural mechanisms and our ability to actually enforce those substantive rights? And, uh, and so I, I look at a lot of the ways in which the procedural mechanisms actually undermine our ability to, um, to, to seek the justice in the court system. Wow. So yeah. Fascinating. Yeah. So fascinating. yeah. Yeah. I, did I tell you I teach a course here on the civil rights movement? That's, um, that's, that's awesome. That's awesome. That so um, you're going to be, would you come and lecture to my class? Would oh, you come okay. and share? Uh, <laughs> I don't point? know if I have anything to add that you haven't already covered, but I, I, I would be thrilled to come and talk a little bit about, you know, about, about my work and um, about sort of the legal, I mean, some of the legal questions and some of the, the quandary that we find ourselves in today in terms of um, you know, that intersection of procedure and substantive rights. So I think one of the things that's, that, that, that can be um, challenging for the students uh, to learn is the limitations of the law, clearly, right? That is not, there's not one way of doing civil rights. As you know, it's so, so important to have all kinds of methods and all kinds of actors um, part of that conversation and, and part of that action. Uh, so yeah, I think it can be, I think it can be somewhat disappointing, but I think it's really important for the students to understand, um, you know, what the law can and cannot do uh, in terms of moving forward. So, so I'd love to, yeah, I'd love to participate at some point. This, I mean, this is so exciting for me because one of the things I try to do in my courses is to make the civil rights movement real. Like mm. for a lot of the students, it happened so long ago. Mm -hmm. How do we sort of mm -hmm. resuscitate it for their imaginations? How do we make this relevant for 18 to 25 year olds in the 21st century? That's a special challenge, I think, for us as professors that we have. So anyway, mm -hmm. kudos to you. I wanna geek out a little bit, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I can't help but to be me. Um, what are you currently working on? I, 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 I'm a geek. I wanna know, well, uh, with all of what you're doing, what are you uh -huh. working on right now? 
So, uh, so thank you for asking. I have, well, I guess really um, two projects, one that just came out, one that I'm shopping around right now as we speak. So sort of fingers crossed, but there's one, uh, one project is a, a, a book that will be coming out in a couple of months. Um, it's called Critical, it's a Critical Procedure. Mm -hmm. And what it is, is a, I'm an editor in this book with three other individuals, three other mm -hmm. professors from other, uh, other schools, law schools. And it's a compilation of about 40 different essays where people, scholars from all over the country are critiquing a procedural uh, component mm -hmm. of our law and asking how did that, you know, how did that rule or statute, who made that rule? Why did they make that rule? And what impact does that rule have, which seems so on the, on the surface neutral and bland, if not outright boring. <laughs> um, but what impact does that have on the ability of people to enforce their substantive mm -hmm. civil rights? And so it might be personal jurisdiction, uh, it might be um, pleadings, it might be class actions, it might mm -hmm. be arbitration, sort of all of these access points. And so it's a beautiful compilation because it's all these different voices from different disciplines. So different types of uh, critical theory um, from historical perspective and so forth, where they ask those questions. And I think they push the students to think early on in their, in their academic career, um, what's the relationship, right, between those access to justice and the substantive rights that we have? So that's coming out um, pretty soon. And then the other, the other piece, what I what I just finished and uh, am shopping around and hoping it'll find a good home, is an article that I wrote, and I've been working on this. It's sort of been a labor of love the last couple of years, but. Um, it basically is, is it time for a new Civil Rights Act, right? Pursuing procedural justice in the federal civil court system. And there I, I examine the last 50 years of, of cases that the Supreme Court has, has ruled in, uh, procedural cases, and demonstrate how sort of slowly and incrementally and insidiously those cases, those decisions have chipped away at people's access to the court system and their ability to challenge civil rights violations under substantive law. And so it's, it's uh, you know, I, I, I compare it to the time period with the Civil Rights Act of 1991, right, which did this, you know, was this, the, basically the Supreme Court um, had maybe it was about eight decisions and Congress did this overhaul and said, wait a minute, the court is moving in the wrong direction. They've got it wrong. We need to come in and do a legislative corrective fix. And so I'm arguing that we're at one of those moments, right? This is a really seminal time and this is an important civil rights issue that is under the radar. So people, you know, they're not paying attention to that. It's not, you know, it's not the kind of thing that ends up in the news a lot. And it's so, you know, it's so slow and it's so subtle that I think, um, you know, the, the, it's, it's the, it's the, the, uh, the, uh, the, um, the compilation of all of these um, decisions, right? Their collective force that is creating the problem. And so it's something to really think about if we, when we're thinking about civil rights uh, statutes, how do we mm -hmm. want to amend them? We better really think hard about uh, procedure, right, and make sure that we're also giving people access channels, whether it become it's it's about pleadings or arbitration or class actions, that we give people the vehicles and the tools to to use those substantive rights, because you know substantive rights would be completely useless without right the procedures to carry them out. So uh, so that's that is uh, that is what I've been working on. And um, so I'm in the process of, you know, letting that baby go and uh, hopefully finding a good home for it so that those ideas, I want to share those ideas, I want to get them out, I think it's wow. time. Uh, and I will say, I think Congress, you know, I think one of our challenges, of course, is Congress is so, is so um, partisan, right? I mean, this hyper partisanship that we're in right now. Yes. Uh, but they are, they have made some progress. There are some, some signs, just a you know, just recently, uh, Biden signed into law, um, a law that, you know, Congress actually got on board with, which uh, does not allow arbitration agreements where people are challenging sexual assault and sexual harassment. And so I think that's a good start. 
And what I would say is I think we need to build from that, right? We also need to protect people who are dealing with racial harassment, or we need to protect people who are dealing with uh, uh, wage theft, right? Um, there's a lot of other civil rights violations that are, are, are as, 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 as painful as powerful, right? Obviously that deserve to have um, the same kinds of procedural protections uh, that are being made available in that legislation. So I, I say, I say, good, it's off to a good start. Let's keep going. Yeah. Yeah. I, I want you to know that uh, I'm, I'm fixing to move to the next question, but <laughs> had I have heard a, a, a law professor like you, a lawyer like you, uh, when I was a high schooler, I probably would be a lawyer right now. Ah. What you say is so fascinating to me on, on a number of different levels. Um, number one, you just shared, at least you just taught me, how mm -hmm. interdisciplinary mm -hmm. law can be, legal studies can be. When you're saying, you know, some people are doing historical research, you're invoking the political nature of things, you're, you're talking about intersectional issues such as race, gender, sexuality, class, uh, immigration status, so on and so forth. Um, you also nod to the fact that what we're calling civil rights seems to always be evolving. So what that what civil rights may have meant in the 1940s or the 1950s evolved uh, in the 1960s and the 1970s, certainly by the time you get to the 80s and the 90s and what have you. So uh, thank you for teaching. Thank you for sharing. Thank you also for making it accessible, which is precisely what the cause conversations are about. Let me move on to the next question. Yeah, Could you sure. tell <laughs> Could you tell us about the Byron R. White Center uh, for the Study of American Constitutional Law, which you are the illustrious director of? <laughs> Thank you. Um, thanks. I, I'm really excited to be directing the center. Uh, it's one of the real attractions of coming to see you and joining the law school community here, uh, because I do very much feel like it is an opportunity to uh, use this platform, um, resources, and so forth um, to have, I think, what are important conversations, public conversations about the Constitution and what it means today. And so I, I appreciate what you were saying before about civil rights are evolving, uh, constitutional rights, you know, what we were, what we may have focused on before, it changes over time. And uh, you know, we get our students there when we talk about the 1960s or we talk about reconstruction even before that. But now, you know, we're in a new time period. We've got Black Lives Matter. We have the Me Too movement. We have a lot in a lot of ways. I feel like the students are teaching me, frankly, you know, I'm learning. Both of us. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, it's evolving. There's, you know, new claims and new statutes and new ideas, which I very much appreciate. Um, and so the Byron White Center is about that public conversation about the constitution and constitutional issues that we really care about, right? That really um, impact our lives. Um, the, the, the center was founded over 30 years ago mm. and um, it was through a generous um, grant from an alumni, um, Ira C. Rothgerber. And we really have, you know, we have, you know, I could, three kind of goals, three parts of our mission, if I, if I uh, can share that. I mean, one is we're trying to support excellence when it comes to constitutional law scholarship. Um, two, we wanna give our law students an opportunity to promote justice, right? To get out there and, and do that kind of work. Yes. And really the third, we really do want to expand public knowledge and have informed conversation about the constitution. And I think that that is particularly critical today. Uh, there's, there's a lot of misinformation um, out there about the constitution, what it says, what it doesn't say, what it does, what it's, um, you know, its founders, its intent and so forth. And so those are the, you know, that's really our goal is to make that, make, make that you know, accessible, as you mentioned, to the public and 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 our not only our law students but the entire community right Absolutely. the Colorado community and not just Colorado right. but actually to have a national and sometimes international conversation about the the constitution and some of the issues that are very very dear to us wow i have been here 17 years and i didn't know some of the stuff about the you know i've heard of the 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 Byron White uh, okay. center but 
So thank you again. I think part of what I want to do with the Center for African and African American Studies is to make Black studies, African American studies, African studies accessible mm. beyond the 700 people that are really geek out about it. I really, <laughs> I think that we should, I, 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 you know, I see us as bridges between the yeah. campus and the community mm. and mm. the work that you're, that, that you are doing um, is so very, very important. I just want to encourage you to keep doing it uh, mm -hmm. and everything. And to be honest with you, I, I certainly looked at your center uh, as a model for how to develop, you know, the Center for African and African American Studies here. And again, this whole public facing uh, 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 of law and sort of mm -hmm. demystifying mm -hmm. that for non-lawyers like myself, mm -hmm. I appreciate that. Keep doing what you're doing. Let's go to the third question. Sure, uh, sure. Could, could you tell us about the Ira C. Rothgerber conference? When did it start? Uh, what is the main focus of the conference, you know, in a, in a broad sense? Mm -hmm. What would you say distinguishes the Rothgerber conference from other critical legal studies conferences? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the Rothgerber conference um, is one of kind of a number of sort of key uh, signature events that we do every year. And I can I can share with you a little bit more about others. But um, I think the Rothgerber conference is particularly special because it brings uh, it brings law students and law professors and scholars and activists and mm. leaders, community organizers, and just plain folks <laughs> from yeah. all over the state of Colorado. And with, um, you know, with Zoom, with remote, um, with remote education, we can meet that conversations actually, we can bring in people from all over the country. And as I mentioned, sometimes even um, from all over the world. And so it, it, it gives us an opportunity to really think about and do a deep dive on a constitutional issue that we really care about. And, um, I, you know, we've, we've done prior conferences. I'll give you some examples of, you know, they've covered First Amendment issues. Um, they've covered immigration and citizenship. That was last year, yes. um, national injunctions. And so, uh, so it's, that, it's that public conversation right, about an issue of constitutional law that is particularly salient, right, important to so many people. Yes. Um, you, you, you asked kind of how is our conference different? Yeah. I, think, I think our conference is different in terms of some of my priorities, some of the things that I really feel strongly about in terms of that conference is that we have diversity and we have diversity among many axes. Good. So, you know, we're sort of, traditional axes, right? I think diversity in terms of race and right. gender and sexual orientation and age and so forth. That's for sure, right? Exactly. You'll see that in every conference, <laughs> everything <laughs> I organize across the board, that is just a given. Um, I think what's, what is interesting too, is that we do try to make this interdisciplinary conversation occur. So it's not just law professors and it's not just professors, frankly, um, but among the professors, we have different yeah. disciplines. And so we've had folks who are historians, who are political scientists, who are sociologists, yeah. immigration scholars, right? So we bring in people of, from different disciplines. Um, we bring in uh, people from different schools. So, you know, I think about the folks who have participated, the scholars coming from Yale, from UCLA, from Howard, from Iowa, mm. from Colorado, just kind of, you name it, sort of across the board, the participants themselves, the scholars, they might be junior scholars, they might be, uh, you know, emerging scholars or folks who have... Um, senior scholars <laughs> who've been in the trenches for a while. And like us? There. Yes, exactly. I'll just put it that way. Um, and then the participants, you know, you do have lawyers and scholars, but you have students, you have community leaders, activists, organizers. Um, you know, last year we had um, some of our community members who were undocumented, for example, sharing their stories. Uh, this year, we have some folks that are formerly incarcerated, mm -hmm. right, that are going to share their personal stories with the criminal justice system. And so, so I, I, I like the fact that the folks are not, we don't just have sort of book knowledge of what we're talking about, but that we also have people who are on the ground. Mm -hmm. These policies impact them in very real ways. And they're bringing an important voice to the conversation, right? It would be sort of ridiculous for us all, you know, 
kind of ponder and think about these things without the, the, the people in the room who are actually central, right? The central figures to the conversation. And so I, I think that's, we do that. And, and I would also say just in terms of viewpoint, we have diversity of viewpoint. Mm. I, the first time I organized a Rothgerber conference, it was about national injunctions that were taking place under the Trump administration, right? And the question was whether uh, uh, courts all over the country could in fact um, stop or enjoin uh, Trump administration policies that were mm. coming out, whether they dealt with civil rights or immigration or so forth. And, uh, and so we definitely had folks on both sides of that issue uh, come to Colorado <laughs> and wrestle with that. So I. You know, so I think that, that that made for a very a very rich conversation. Wow. Um, and then I guess the last thing, I'm sorry, I hope I'm not uh, Please. drowning this is you a out conversation. here. <laughs> this is a I'm conversation. Excited. <laughs> I'm excited. <laughs> but um, the one of the things I really like, it started last year, and we're going to do it again this year, is we've added an artistic component oh. to the Rock River Conference. So that the day before, the night before, uh, instead of uh, just doing a dinner, which obviously can be very nice, but uh, we, we are working with Modus Theater, which is here in Colorado. And they have people who do autobiographical monologues. Mm. They write them, they perform them. Mm. And they perform them. There was musical interludes. Wow. There's poetry. It's a very uh, moving and beautiful experience. So people last year uh, mentioned our undocumented um, community members read their monologues or they called them undocumented monologues last year mm. and then this year they have a series called just us and it is folks who participated who have been in the criminal justice system right mm. formerly incarcerated who also will be reading out loud their monologues and not only do they they share their monologue but then they bring in a guest a guest reader who will read one of the monologues out loud who normally wouldn't be in the shoes of the person who wrote the monologue. So last year, mm -hmm. there was an immigration judge who read the monologue of somebody who was undocumented, yeah. <laughs> right? And then they have a conversation, right? Which is just so powerful to have yeah. that, that interaction. Um, so that's the night before. And I, I love it because I think it really sets a tone for the conference, it kind of grounds us um, in, in reality, and in why we're doing this work and kind of speaks to our heart, not just our heads. Wow. So mm. Oh. Mm. thank you for that. I'm just going to have to let it breathe for a moment. I'm sorry. I mean, yeah. Just, yeah. It. Like, can I come and take your class, please, <laughs> Professor Malvo? Can I get in the room? All right. Listen, um, next question. How yeah, did you sure. choose this year's theme, uh, which is looking back to move forward? exploring the legacy of U.S. slavery. How did you come to that theme for this year's conference? Yeah, um, so one of the things that, one of the things that uh, struck me is um, we have a new dean, right? And yes. uh, and so I have her, it's her book, basically. I've given a little plug for this. So this is, <laughs> here it is. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah, so our new dean, uh, Lolita Buckner Ennis, um, has this book called The Princeton Fugitive Slave, The Trials mm. of James Collins Johnson. Mm. And um, her work, I think, is very compelling. Um, she's a law professor. She's also a historian. And so she really brings to the table an interesting, it's a, you know, it's like a slave, it's like a slave narrative, but it's also a, a, a huge um, expose of the relationship between Princeton College and the institution of slavery, right? Wow. Through the story of, of um, this former slave. And so I felt like, one, I thought it would be great to explore, to talk a little bit about our new Dean's um, scholarship. And she is the, you know, to add, she is the uh, first African-American female Dean at a law school. And so, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. First black Dean, first black female Dean. Yeah. So, so wow. that's, uh, yeah, it's pretty, pretty cool. Um, but, you know, we're really, you know, I'm really, really uh, proud and excited of her work. So I thought that would be good to share. Um, and, and then also, I mean, it just, uh, it comes within a larger context, obviously. So there are about three dozen colleges and universities that uh, make up this um, consortium, the University Studying Slavery Consortium, where they're looking at the relationship between higher education 
um, and slavery. Hmm. And they're thinking about what role did higher education play in the institution of slavery? A huge one, I would Great say. Yes. Yeah. And what what role do they have in terms of repair, right? Repairing Good. the breach. What are the what are the what's the the um, ongoing impact of that role? And do they have you know what can they do to be a part of the the repair, right? And so, you know, as you know, I mean, the topic of slavery has gotten a lot of additional attention, right? Current attention today in terms of people's scholarship. And it's particularly important, I think, to, to talk about that history, mm. uh, to teach the truth, right? Yes. Not run from it. Yes. Um, <laughs> so, so that's, you know, and to see the through line, right? Between slavery and the, you know, 250, I mean, the, the, the centuries of uh, subordination from that institution that brings us here today, right? And so when we talk about institutional racism or we talk about you know the vestiges of slavery what are we talking about what does that look like today mm. how do we appreciate that and then how do we get to the 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 repair part wow i have a couple so, of things number one yeah. thank you for giving uh, a brand new uh, dean of the law school a warm welcome oh uh, yeah that's number one uh number two um uh, you should be her agent because the way you just marketed <laughs> the way you just marketed her book no, i want to extend the invitation i want to have her on the show so we can yes. talk about the book uh, so tell her pretty please uh yeah. would you please come and have a cause conversations about the book and then lastly yeah the, the level of collegiality the level of collegiality that you are showing I, I just think that this is the energy this is the vibe that i hope the brand new center center for african and african-american studies mm -hmm. can help to create. So I, I would like for, for, for y'all to be affiliate faculty of our new center, but this is the very vibe though, right? That we want to um, have here. We want to build a sense of black community on the Boulder campus, a predominantly white campus. But imagine Suzette, here's a space where you and I can have this conversation now. We, we've never got a chance to meet before. And <laughs> Your work is the bomb diggity. I probably shouldn't have put bomb <laughs> on the internet, but anyway, I mean, your work is off the chain, incredible on so many different levels. I just want to shout you out. I want to shout out the brand new Dean. I've got to have her here. Please let her know that brother Rebecca wants to interview you for the yeah. class, uh, conversation. <laughs> so uh, tied to all of that, um, I'd like to ask who are some of the main speakers at this year's conference and which presentations are you most looking forward to? Well, um, so I can't, I, I, I have to be careful because I, yeah. I love all my children <laughs> put it that way. So they're, they're, um, yeah, I think they're all going to bring something really fun to the table. I, I think, uh, I think it'll be interesting. The first, I mean, the kickoff on Friday, it will be a conversation, uh, between our Dean and a historian, uh, uh, Dr. Green from uh, University of Alabama. So I think that that will be quite interesting. Uh, what, what, what I personally am uh, gravitating towards is there's a round table that comes right afterwards that looks at the Tulsa race massacre of 1921. And there, it, it involves, there are a couple of law professors um, along with myself, uh, a pastor from the historic AME church that was one of the few places not destroyed mm. in Tulsa back in 1921 and also a lawyer who is currently working on a new case. Um, so this is going to be, that for me is personally rewarding because it is going to be like a reunion of sorts. Like I was involved in, I was involved in the case uh, 20, over 20, uh, over 20 years ago. That was the first, first constitutional law case that was brought against the government for their participation in the Tulsa race massacre. And we represented a lot of the survivors um, in that case, and that case uh, legally was not successful, right, because of statute of limitations and a variety of other obstacles. Uh, so, so in some ways, this is a this is a reunion of those folks that worked on that case. I was a baby lawyer at the time. Um, my colleagues, you know, some of my colleagues were baby lawyers, and uh, we had, you know, one was the president of uh, INCOBRA, the reparations, national yes. reparations organization. And we had, you know, we were part of a dream team of people, many of uh, many who are no longer with us, uh, Johnny Cochran. Um, we worked with Professor uh, Charles Ogletree. 
uh, we worked with John Hope Franklin. So we had some just, you know, superstars, obviously, that were, were part of that effort. And um, so we're kind of like the baby lawyers from the group that are getting back together again. And I think doing sort of a, a reflections about that and sort of where do we go from here? So I'm, I'm excited about, um, and we have the Reverend, I mean, we, <laughs> so I think we are gonna have a lot of, uh, a lot of, a lot of good, you know, good conversation. Uh, and then the other panels, we have three panels after that. Um, one that we'll be talking about uh, institutional complicit, complicity in slavery. So we will have some scholars talking about uh, higher ed and the judiciary, their participation. Um, the second one will be vestiges of slavery in the criminal justice system, which is gonna be particularly, I think, relevant to the conversation. Uh, and then the third panel, I'm happy to say, is sort of bringing it home. Mm. So that's where we're going to be looking at um, Colorado, right? The state of Colorado. Yes. Um, you know, how, how does this play out when we think about um, property and land ownership? Mm. And so we'll be having a, a councilwoman. We'll be having folks who are on the ground mm. who are dealing with policies today. And I, I really like that because we sort of start big picture and we kind of drill down. So by the end of the day, we want to see like, well, what's going on in my own backyard, mm. right? And what could I possibly do, right? So some action steps. So it's not just a lot of talking, talking, <laughs> talking the entire time, but you know, are, what are people doing today that will, could make a difference, right? And get, we want to at least let people know how they can get involved if they so choose. Um, so that's, that, that, will, that will end our day. And then the fun part about the Rothgerber conference is that we will then go on a hike uh, because, <laughs> yeah, for those who like to, you're not required, but we will go uh, to talk. Well, we did this before, and uh, yeah, we had we had a lot of we had a lot of fun. We did the hike and baby hike. Nothing really, you know, nothing intense. But many people love coming to Boulder in Colorado because of the you know the hiking and all. So we do try to do a little baby hike and then have dinner afterwards. And so that should be, uh, yeah, that should that should be fun. And then people. You know, they go back. They go back home um, to California and DC, and you know wherever they came from. Um, and many, you know, they're welcome to stay for the weekend and do a little vacation. But that's that's on them. <laughs> they are released. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, yeah, but I'm looking forward to us getting back in person. We we have been remote the last two years, okay. uh, which is fine, you know. Uh, but I I I so appreciate having the opportunity to actually connect with people in person, um, spend that time together, so. This sounds so, so very, very incredible. Uh, this is not on the sheet. What days again? I should have asked you. So this <laughs> so is, I think, yes. Friday, April 8th. Uh, so it's coming up. It's coming right. up. It's in a couple of weeks. So stay tuned. And April 7th, the night before that Thursday at Modus Theater is where it, that's at uh, 5.30, I think 5.30 to 7.00 is the, um, the, the beautiful monologues and music and poetry and reflections. And then we start Friday morning with the conference itself. So we do encourage everybody to register in advance so they get access. Uh, we'd love for people to attend in person. And if not, there will be an opportunity to jump on a link okay. and be you know remotely involved. Excellent. Excellent. Mm -hmm. um, and all of this information is available on your website. I got a chance to look at the program yes. Yes. Uh, order and you, they can register and everything. And if I'm correct, we are going to be flashing the program flyer um, oh, great. during okay. this as well. But again, we want to try to send as much um, uh, traffic uh, and people your way. And again, thank you for um, listing the cause, uh, the Center for African and African American Studies as a co-sponsor. Um, we both have said as directors, uh, that this is only the be beginning and yeah. that this is the kind of partnership you know between two interdisciplinary and intersectional centers yes. we are trying i mean this is institutional transformation this is what institutional transformation looks like okay next okay. question <laughs> oh man well i feel so good today um uh, are cu law students involved in the conference and is this part of their professionalization and how you mentor your students so, so definitely, uh, the, that we do have, um, our, you know, first of all, we hope that many of them will attend the conference. Yes. That would be wonderful. Um, 
But not only that, the students are intimately involved in organizing the conference. We have what are called White Center Fellows. And so we have almost, uh, I guess, about a half dozen students that participate uh, throughout the year or selected because of their, you know, their, their skills and their qualities and their leadership and so mm -hmm. forth. And they help, we, you know, we have a, a weekly meeting actually. And we, we all sit, we brainstorm, we come up with ideas about what we want the panels to look like, who we want to invite. So they're kind of boots on the ground. Um, mm -hmm. They do a lot of research and some of them will actually be moderating those panels. So they have um, an intimate role that they're, you know, a direct role that they're playing in the conference itself. And then in addition to the White Center Fellows, we also have students who are on the Colorado Law Review. Mm. And that's sort of our mainline law review on campus where they will be publishing the work of the participants, right? It's not a requirement, but it's an opportunity. So for those who would like to publish, then they are able to publish in the law review, whether that's, a, you know, an article or an essay or their remarks, um, you know, or a monologue, that kind of thing, wow. or poetry. So you, we've had a lot of different types of contributions. For real? Yeah, yeah. But they will, we have a special symposium edition that the law review does. And so those students, those editors are working, you know, closely with participants who would like to um, publish their work. And I think that's, I think that's great because it means that we share, we, we have a greater audience, right? It gives you sort of another bite at the apple in terms of their sharing their ideas. So, uh, so yeah, the students are definitely in the mix or a part of it. Uh, hopefully we'll be part of our hike too, maybe leading our hike, <laughs> helping us along. <laughs> For real. Oh, wow. This is, this yeah. is so incredible. You just taught yeah. me uh, that in a law review, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, part of this I got from, uh, you know, I teach a course here, as you know, on critical race theory, mm -hmm. uh, a PhD mm -hmm. level seminar. And I, what attracted me to CRT uh, was some of the short stories and, and the poetry and mm -hmm. um, just the, the testimonies and the autobiography. And I mean, you know, I think that some of our conceptions of law and law school Mm. are very one dimensional and it was CRT it was it was Kimberly Crenshaw who you know Derek Bell it was folks like that folks like yourself and Devin uh Carbato Carbato at UCLA uh -huh. um yeah I mean I just think that they really sort of made law multi-dimensional mm. for me to be perfectly mm -hmm. honest with you and I'm somebody who again coming out you know HBCUs Charles Hamilton Houston Thurgood Marshall I mean there are so many folks like that but this this felt a little hip hop to me. It was remixed, you know, it was a little, <laughs> it was great. remixing law, right? And again, I mean, like, you know, we can hold the misogyny and the hyper-masculinism and the queer phobia and transphobia of hip hop. I mean, that, that other kind of hip hop that I teach, which uh -huh. is intersectional, uh -huh. um, which is hip hop feminism and hip hop queer studies and hip hop trans studies and so on and so forth. Yeah, it felt like there was some room in there mm -hmm. for folks like myself who are a bit freaky and geeky and alternative <laughs> and experimental and you know black bohemian it yeah it just made us feel at home mm. and, and so you're saying here at Colorado that the journal a lot I'm like wait I've been here 17 years how can I not know this <laughs> so <laughs> well, really that's incredible yeah and it's a really I you know I do think a credit to the students right in terms of like I you know I think that they are opening uh, opening up that space, right, which is a very traditional space. And, you know, as you know, from, you know, law review articles, they're quite regimented in terms of what the formula is and what you expect and what they look like. And so I appreciate that the students themselves are thinking outside the box and thinking, how do we make sure that we're being inclusive and that, you know, the people's voices are coming through in the different forms that they, they, they use so uh, so I do uh, I very much appreciate their you know their leadership on that. Wow! So it looks like we're both are saying that our students are our teachers. Like our students mm. teach us. Mm. At least oh, yeah. I, I, every Tuesday and Thursday I go to school. Right? I mean, my students. How do you think I've been able to teach hip hop for seventeen years? They're <laughs> the ones who are giving me mixtapes and saying you need to know this artist. You need to download this video and boom boom boom. Yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, even my Black Lives Matter movement class, that's how it came yeah. about. The students 
Uh, one of the class, they said, hey, Dr. Baca, you're teaching us a class on the Harlem Renaissance, on the Civil Rights Movement, on the Black Power Movement, on the Women's Lib Movement. What about a class on our movement? You know, uh, BLM, and this is yeah. me trying to be yeah. responsive in real time to show people something that Bell Hook said in Teaching to Transgress, yeah. that education should be transformative and exciting. Mm. And you know, they don't fall asleep in my classes. Come on. Okay, anyway, <laughs> I, got, I got two more questions. What are, some of the, <laughs> what are some of the key takeaways you'd like for attendees to walk away from this year's conference with? Yeah, I, I think I, um, you know, I'd love for them to, first of all, to come and they don't have to come for the entire thing, right? But even if they come for a little bit of it, um, you know, some portion of their day, because it's, it, it's a full day. Um, but to come with an open mind, to come to, to learn, uh, to come to share, sort of be part of that conversation. Everyone is welcome yeah. into the conversation. Uh, and I just, I feel like it's an important time for us to educate ourselves. As I mentioned before, I think there's a lot of misinformation that's out there. And so I think we want to start with the baseline of what is true mm. and, uh, and to, to really listen hard um, and, and benefit from the experience of others. I mean, the people that are coming to share were so, so fortunate. And some of these folks have been studying this for decades, right? Studying and writing and thinking and living out some of these experiences mm. for such a long time that we're so privileged to have them and to be able to, to learn from them. So, so I do invite people to, to come. I think it's particularly important today to, you know, maybe it seems like, oh, slavery, that was, you know, so long ago, what's, what's that got to do with anything? But I think you come and you, you learn, right? You learn and you see and you grow and, you know, that's, um, and when we'll all be doing that, trust me, we'll all be doing that together. So. Wow. You know, I, yeah. I want to say I'm blown away. This has been such an incredible conversation let's say that this is the first of uh many and great, when great. whenever your new book comes out i would certainly love to have you back here with us uh in the center for african and african american studies uh i want to thank uh the audience for uh uh, uh eavesdropping on this <laughs> cause conversation intellectual eavesdropping on this cause conversation it has been so edifying for me i've learned so much from you and we were joined today by professor suzette malvo Moses Lasky Professor of Law uh, at the University of Colorado Law School. Uh, Professor Malvo is also the director of the Byron R. White Center for the Study of American Constitutional Law. Um, I'm Raylan Rabaka. Uh, this is the Center for African and African American Studies and you have been watching The Cause Conversations. Lift every voice and sing. Lift every voice and sing. Lift every voice and sing.